All right. So before the break, we looked at this example, right? Which basically where we introduced this capacitor C1 at the input. And we saw that as a result of that, the bandwidth estimation that we got from the zero value time constants, ZVTs, became significantly inaccurate, right? Because this capacitor by itself introduced a large time constant. And when we took that into the sum, it estimated a bandwidth of 34 megahertz. But then when we looked at the actual simulation results, we saw that the bandwidth is more than an order of magnitude higher. And we noticed that this was due to actually a zero that we intentionally had placed on top of the first dominant pole, which is coming from the Miller multiplication of this capacitance plus C pi at the input, and we tried to place that on top of that. So by design, we had made it in such a way that it would work. But this failure of the estimation is too drastic. So the question is that can we come up with a way to make a modification to it or identify this and modify the ZVT in a way that it would improve or it would not do this thing. So let's go back to see where the ZVTs came from. So this was also what we did before the break, which we saw that, that in any the transfer function of an nth order system, B1 coefficient is given by the sum of the zero value time constants. And then A1, we also calculated it before, to be the same zero value time constant scaled by, the, what, what, by the, what we call the transfer constants, right? These constants that are determined by setting the ith element to infinite value. And we know that the superscript index is the index of the elements that are being infinite valued, right? So this is the rule we use. So when we did that, so we have also an estimate of A1. So if you think about these two, then what you have is the problem in that example arose because we ignored the numerator, right, terms. We assume the numerator has no zeros. This was the assumption we made to get to this approximation, right? But now if there's something in the numerator, then you, this assumption this is going to fail. So to first order, if your numerator is not like this, if your numerator were in fact a0 plus a1s plus a2s squared all the way up, around omega h, if I wanted to pick one term from the numerator to make it one more, a little bit more accurate, which term should I put, pick? The same way that we picked only b1 term from the denominator, the first term that will kick in is a1s, right? So then a better approximation perhaps is to say this is a0 plus a1s. Right? So if you make that approximation, then let's see what happens to our calculation. So now if we take this and factor A0, what do we have? We have A1 over A0s divided by 1 plus B1s. So now if we wanted to get an estimate of the bandwidth, omega h, the high cutoff, the 3dB cutoff in the high frequency, then we can modify this, right? Because we can say, look, you know, so let's get rid of these. So if I have a first order response looking like this, before we approximated the drop due to only B1. But now this one will kick in, too. But how will it kick in? Would it help or hurt the bandwidth? Would it increase the bandwidth if you have a term like this, term like this around omega h? Would it make the drop slower or faster? So think about it. Without the numerator term, right? So let's say you had some sort of a drop due to the denominator terms. Now, if you have a zeros around that frequency, which is this is what it means, right? What would zeros do to the amplitude response? Left half or right half plane? The amplitude response. They push them up, right? So then it's likely that it will be looking like that. So to first order, these guys come and cancel the effect of this. The first, to, to first order, they, they not cancel fully, but they counteract, let's say, not cancel. They counteract the effect of these guys. So if I wanted to then modify the approximation we had before, before we said this is a, approximately 1 over b1. So what should I say now? It's basically, it's reducing the effect of b1. So it's, it's fair to say it's 
A1 over A0, right? So it's basically trying to counteract that effect. So this is a better approximation. And if A1 is insignificant, this reduces the previous approximation, right? Because then if A1 is not there, if you don't have any dominant elements in the numerator, then this is nothing. So they go back to what you had. So if you look at this, though, and if you expand these two, you will see something interesting. You will see that it's one. So B1 was the sum of the time con. We know this, right? So it's the sum of tau i zeros. And A1 is the same sum scaled by h i's. And now A0 is h0, right? So I can write this as minus sum of tau i zeros to n h i over h zeros. And then you can see that I can aggregate this into one sum. Now it's easy to see. It's tau i zero times one minus h i over h i zero h zero. So you can see that there's a modified time constant essentially. So the ZVTs can be done with this modified time. Some of your time constants need to be modified by this factor. It appears to, right, to be the case. However, there is, this is great if you are looking at left half plane zeros. What if you have right half plane zeros? What would happen? If you have right half plane zeros, this is already negative. So this is going to do the opposite, right? It's going to increase your time constant, not reduce it. But what is the effect of a right half plane zero on the amplitude response? It still pushes it up. It's the same thing as a left half plane zero. So how do you think we should modify this to make it more accurate? Make it absolute value, right? So a better approximation of this thing, so so we can say omega h approximation is a better approximation, is to say it's the sum of what I call zero, tau i zero primes, the modified time constants, where tau i zero prime is tau i zero, one minus the absolute value of h i over h zero. So my time constants get modified by 1 minus absolute value of h i over h 0. Now, do I modify every time constant? No. First of all, you only need to worry about the ones that have non-zero h i's. And there are not that many often. There are few of them that have non-zero h i's. But even if they were all of them, you look at h i over h 0. You see if it's, is it comparable or greater than 1? Or is it significantly smaller? If it's like 0 0.001, what's the point of worrying about it? So you do, do your time constant calculations, but you just make modifications to some of your time constants, the ones that actually have an impact. Well, let's see. Let's go back to our previous example, the one that gave us trouble, and see what happens if you do that. So this was the one we had before. And this is the way we calculated that, so I don't think we need this anymore, but I'll keep it for now. So these are the four time constants we calculated, the originals, right? So now we have to see which ones need modification and how much, or correction, in fact. So let's see. Uh, okay. Now, there are only two that have non-zero HIs, right? Not all four of them. So there's an H1. Right? So let's write this here. There's an h, uh, so there's h pi. What is h pi? T that transfer constant h pi. Infinite value element pi, c pi, right? So what is, what is the transfer const function constant? Zero. That's zero, right? Because if you short circuit this, infinite value, you've short circuited it, you get nothing. What is, well, what is h l? also zero. There's an h mu that's non-zero, and then there's an h1 that's non-zero. We suspect that most of this nonsense is caused by h1 anyway, right? But we'll 
just for the sake of com uh, completion, we'll calculate H mu and see how, why it doesn't matter. So H mu, you short circuit this and everything else is open circuited, right? So you've short circuited this, what is left of transistor? Alpha RM, right? Because you basically short circuited across that, in the T model, you've short circuited across the current source. What's left is alpha RM. So you have an alpha RM, R1 and R2. So it's alpha RM parallel R2 voltage divider with an R1. So it's basically alpha RM parallel R2 divided by alpha RM parallel R2 plus R1. That's H mu. Now, what is this? What is this ratio? And even better, what is this ratio divided by the gain? But what what is, what is this ratio right now as is? So what is this ratio? I mean, we know the numbers, right? Rm is whatever. Well, forget about alpha for a second. Rm is 25 ohms, right? R2 is 2 kilo ohms. So that's like roughly 25 ohms. 25 ohms divided by 25 plus 2 kilo ohms. That's one one, less than 1 one hundredth, right? It's less than 0.01. Now, what you really care about is H mu over H0. Your H0, which is your DC gain, we calculated this, right? A0 over H0, which was like negative 57. So you get 0.01 divided by 57. Whatever it is, is very small, right? I don't even need to worry about this. I mean, you can calculate what it is. It's like 0 0.0002. So is it going to make a difference in my time constant calculations? Is it going to make a change to that time constant significantly? No, it's going to be 1 minus a very small amount. I'm not even going to worry about it. Right? So how about H1? What is H1? So A0, by the way, what was A0? We talked about this before. It was basically the, the DC gain, the resistive divider at the input. R pi over R1 plus R pi times negative GM R2, right? That was the thing. Now, what is H1? The transfer constant H1. Yeah, you don't have the voltage divider. Now, the input is directly connected. So if this is short-circuited, you see, the good thing about these calculations is that every single one of them make the circuit simpler because you're shorting and opening across things. You shouldn't make it more complicated. So you have the gain exactly as you pointed out. So what is, the, what is H1? Negative GM R2. So therefore, what is the ratio of H1 over H0? R1 plus R pi. R1 plus R pi is the inverse of that, right? Because the GM R, R L part, R2 part of it cancels. So that minus sign does cancel too. So you get R1 over R1 plus R pi. So it becomes basically 1 plus um, R1 over R pi, right? Which you can numerically calculate if you want. So it's basically 1 plus, this is 2.5. This is 1 divided by 2.5. So this is basically 1.4. So now this is significant. This will have a significant correction. So what is the modified tau 1? So tau 1 prime, but this is the only one I need to modify, right? So tau 1 0 prime is going to be tau 1 0 times 1 minus this, the absolute value of that, which in this case is positive, so it wouldn't make a difference. But So what is this number? Negative 0 0.4. So you get 3 so picoseconds times negative 0 0.4. And whatever that is, let's see, I don't remember what the number is. Let's find out what it is. You can calculate it. Um, I haven't calculated it anyway. Uh, yes, it's negative 1230. See, modified time constants can actually be negative. The, the ZVTs cannot for a regular standard circuit, just like for a typical circuit. 
I mean, there are, if you have negative resistances, you can have that, but then you're talking about right half plane poles and things of that sort. We'll talk about that. Something when you make an oscillator, for example, that's what you do. But for typical kind of like circuits of this sort, you don't worry about it. But anyway, these guys can be negative. So what is now what happens to the sum of my time constants? So the sum of the time constants, now you can see this almost cancels that. Right? You have another 30 left. So that would be this 70, which can makes it 40 picoseconds. And then you have 440 picoseconds. So that gives you a omega h estimation of the sum of the zero value, modified zero value time constants, which is going to be 1 over 440 picoseconds. OK? And uh, that basically will come out to be roughly um, 362 megahertz, which is much closer, much more reasonable in terms of what you're getting. It's still not exact, but it's in the right ballpark. Right? So you can see that this modification. Now, do I modify this all the time? No. What do I look for? I look for situations where my H's are becoming larger or comparable. My transfer constants are becoming comparable to H0. Because then I need to make that correction, right? Does that make sense? So I keep an eye on H's. I mean, I don't even need to calculate some of them, right? I mean, exactly. I know if I short circuit this, the gain is going to be small, right? But what I see is that when I short circuit this one, the gain is becoming larger. That basically means that it's just pushing up. OK, so that's for that. So any questions on this?